The world is going through challenging times, and it's changing the way that we live and the way we do business. There will be hockey games and celebrations and fun times with friends and family. Kids will go back to school, and there will be graduations again. But in the meantime, we are trying to adapt to our new normal. Bernstein & Associates is still here doing what we've always done, and that's being present for our community. If you've been hurt, call me or go to our website. My team and I are here for you 24-7, and that will never change. It's the Ed Bernstein Show, Home Edition. Now, here's your host, Ed Bernstein. Well, on top of everything else, we have a primary election coming up. And we have a lot of, a lot of candidates running in this election, and some of them are really uh, suffering when you talk about some of the problems with the virus. One of those problems is getting out to meet people. So in an effort to try to help that, we're having some of our judicial candidates come on the show and, and speak directly to our viewers. First one we have is Mary Kay Holthus, who is a sitting district court judge. And a little bit later on in the show, Nadia Kral, who is a candidate for judge, will be on our show. Uh, judge, how are you? I'm Can great. You I'm yeah. good. Thank you. Good. So you for having me. You're one of our um, newer elected judges. Right. So how did that work? You, you ran, you had to run uh, like last year and now you have to run again. I ran um, in 2018 and I ran against an incumbent who had been appointed to a partial term. So it was only a two year term and became due again now. So I have to rerun for my seat. How is it different now? I mean, the first time you ran, you ran, as you said, against a sitting judge. You were kind of a outsider, I guess. Um, you beat him. And now you're the incumbent. So how is that different to you? Well, I like to think I now have a record to run on. Um, I think I've shown what I can do and that, that I'm hardworking and that I'm taking it seriously. And my experience, I believe, has paid off. Obviously, I've only been on the bench 18 months, but um, been in the courtrooms for so long. I think I've shown that I, I know what I'm doing. I'm still learning, obviously, in the civil. I have a criminal civil split now, um, 27 years as a prosecutor. Obviously, I only handled criminal cases. Um, so it's, I had two years prior to that in civil litigation. So I had some basics, but I've definitely you know, spent my bulk of my time in the 18 months trying to get up to speed on a civil. Yeah, because you have quite a, a bit of experience in, in the criminal. You had uh, something somewhere around 150 criminal trials as a district attorney. Um, that's a lot of trials. I don't know anybody that has had that many trials. Uh, probably not a lot. I mean, there's not a lot of venues, obviously, and civil, you don't have the opportunity. Um, but in criminal, we, we sure did. Yeah. So um, out of law school, did you, um, did you work, uh, go right into the DA's office or did you work somewhere else first? No, I did. Um, I was over at Jones, Jones, Close and Brown at the time. It was a civil firm and I did that for two years and then it was just a, a lark a co-worker suggested I go interview at the DA's office and went and the rest is history. I spent 27 years there loving every minute of it. I did 16 years on the special victims unit prosecuting sexual abuse, child abuse, and domestic violence cases. Um, and then we did everything from misdemeanors to murders. We were in court every single day. So it was, it was the dream job and I never dreamt I'd leave it. Yeah, I mean, having had so many trials, when you're sitting there now as a district court judge, um, what's going through your head? Are you thinking, boy, this, I would have said this or I would have done that? I mean, you, are you always, uh, you know, thinking about what, how you would have handled a particular case? For sure. To a, to a degree, I do. Um, I'm also sympathetic because I know how hard it is and, and what's going on. But yeah, at first I, I was a, uh, Sitting on, I was on the bench during a trial, and one of the attorneys had said something that I thought was objectionable. But I went into my, you know, I'm taking notes and I'm focusing on the trial itself. 
And all of a sudden I kind of just went back to my old days and I'm, I'm looking down, taking notes. And all of a sudden I just went up with objection. I went, oh, that's not my job. Sorry. And it, it literally just had been so routine for me, but I'm, I'm getting there and a lot of good lawyers out there doing a good job. So, and they've been extremely gracious to me. You know, you found your bearings uh, from law school out uh, in the East Coast, Philadelphia area, Philanova you went to. I found your way out to Las Vegas where you raised a family here. Um, that was all new for you. How, I mean, what brought you to Las Vegas originally? Uh, an old boyfriend, really. <laughs> he used to come out a lot, so I came out to visit and then was just looking for a new place. I grew up in a very small town, so I was still kind of small town oriented. But Vegas felt small town with a big town to it. Yeah. It, it just... And, and I got here, and, and like I said, I just loved it. And eventually my mom moved out here, and my sister moved out here, and my aunt and my uncle. And so now we've got family here, and it's home. And you went from a really cold place to a very hot place. Right? I, I, yeah. <laughs> Do I have three kids, two of them are in, at the Boyd Law School. They are. A little bit of your influence, I guess. Uh, well, dad too. <laughs> <laughs> when your kids graduate Boyd, are you encouraging them to get into uh, so doing something similar to what you did, going to the district attorney's office or? Um, whatever they want to do. They, they, need, they need to follow their, their thing. I mean, my daughter um, is definitely interested in that avenue. My son's looking more at civil. And then, then we've got the baby who's who's doing musical theater and he's heading to LA in September when everything opens up. Yeah, okay. I hope it's open that, all right, by then. I mean, the sad part about, one of the sad parts about this virus thing going on is that there's nothing new on TV, right? <laughs> there's always Netflix. But, you know, but for you to campaign in this environment is also very challenging. Virtually impossible, which is why I'm so appreciative of this opportunity from you. Because we can't go to group gatherings. We can't go anywhere. It's certainly not a, a time that um, asking for money feels appropriate when people are, are struggling like they're struggling. So it, it's a whole different world. We're just kind of in a, a wait and see, keep trying to do our job. We're still working, um, still going to court three days a week. So how, how does that work in, in court right now? Do you have, um, do you have any trials? No. Oh. We theoretically could do a bench trial remotely if somebody wanted to. So far, nobody has been interested, but all jury trials have been suspended. So criminal trials aren't going forward and, and civil jury trials aren't going forward. So our civil calendars are done exclusively remotely, on video or audio. And then two days a week, we still handle criminal calendars. Um, for the most part, in custody individuals, we're all in we have two separate courtrooms that are set up. We go, I go down to the lower level where the inmates are actually brought over to court, but they're behind glass. Um, and they try to keep them separated. Obviously everybody's masked up. My staff and I are all masked up. Um, and it's a strange, but yeah. we're doing our job. Living in, in strange times, but I know the review journal had, um, so, um, um, some candidate, um, um, programs going on they had uh, what some debates or something that they they've aired and have our show but other than that i mean i don't really know how you get the message out especially you know when you're running for um, a, a district court position it's a county everybody in clark county yes. you, start, you have to reach everybody and there's you know, people are thinking of other campaigns and other things on their mind right now on a good day it's hard to reach that many people and and with what we've got going on right now it's even harder. But again, programs like you and the RJ um, debates, I won't do those yet because I don't have a primary. Mm -hmm. So I won't be on the ballot until November. So my, I believe our debates will run later. Okay. And what was you know, one of the more surprising skills or characteristics um, that you notice that you may need as going for a trip as a, as a district judge compared to being an attorney. I mean, was there anything that really surprised you with uh, personality or characteristic or trait wise that you um, needed to develop? 
I mean, a lot of people thought it was going to be a leap and asking about, you know, going from prosecutor to a judge. But like I've said, as a prosecutor, one of the luxuries we had was our job was to pursue justice. I didn't have anything. I didn't have an agenda. It was just to do what was right. And that's pretty much how it's continued as a judge. Um, I was, I was a pretty hardcore prosecutor. Um, you know, people who needed to go to prison for a long time, I was very comfortable putting in prison for a long time. But even then I was also a super proponent of the diversionary programs, you know, longer term solutions for people who just mess up because of things beyond their control, whether it's drugs or mental health issues or something they can't help. But for that individual and long term society interest, that would be the way to go anyway, whether as a prosecutor or a judge. So I don't know that it's dramatically changed. Obviously, I now have a, I have conversations with defendants where I, 27 years, I wasn't allowed to do that. But I can now have an individual directly talk to me or ask me and, and, and we can have a, a conversation. And again, I have victims coming in as well to, to give me their impact. So I think, um, I don't know that it's much different, but maybe a little more sympathetic on all fronts. Yeah. How about, you know, as, uh, you know, I always think, you know, as a judge, you really have to learn patience, particularly with some of the lawyers, right? Yeah. You know, we're lawyers. We like to talk. <laughs> it's your job, so that's fine. And it's my job to listen to you, so I don't really mind. <laughs> well, that's a good scenario. That's a great trait to have as a judge, <laughs> just a listening trait. Not a, and not bad practice for a mother as well, right? Right. Yeah. We practice for over the years. But it's, it's really been a, it's an amazing experience. And when you look forward to uh, re-election, it's a six-year term. The next six years, um, what would you like to accomplish? Just kind of keep, keep doing my thing. And, you know, hopefully see some success stories from individuals I put in uh, programs. Hopefully get some bad guys off the street. Um, find some, some justice for, some, for everybody, quite frankly. Just doing my thing. Um, obviously, I want to keep keep learning in the civil front. There's so much out there, so much to learn. The criminal, I mean, I mean, that's what I do. So it's kind of second nature. And I, I feel fortunate to have the experience to kind of be able to evaluate a case, evaluate a, a defendant, evaluate a, a victim situation and, and ultimately do just and be efficient about it. I think that's one of the biggest problems in our system is it's so slow and Justice delayed is justice denied. And the faster we can get things to court, the faster we can get people where they're supposed to be, whether it's prisoner back on the streets or, you know, reducing costs for litigants in, in civil so that more people have access to the courts. We're all concerned about, um, about the next election. You're running in this general election. You have a presidential election at the same time. That's going to take up all, all the conversation in the room. Um, are you concerned at all about actually having a, a fair election come November? I mean, there's a lot of talk about some people are talking about just mail-in. Other people are concerned about, you know, showing up at the polls. Are, are you concerned about it? Yeah. I am a public servant. I'm a career prosecutor, and now I'm a judge. I'm not a politician. I honestly, I, I don't have an answer for you. I mean, I, I hope at the end of the day, it's going to be huge. There's so many judicial seats out there and it is going to be difficult. I mean, even on a good year, the judges kind of are towards the bottom and they're not, they're, there's not a lot known about them. So it's going to be that much more challenging to have so many of us, to have the presidential election going on, to have just the other, the other completely who to thunk stuff that's going on that I, I don't even, I have no idea how that all plays into it. I'm just going to keep plugging and doing my thing and hope for the best. Well, it's going to be um, a learning experience for all of us. So we'll try to get through it as best we can and keep good people like you in, on the bench. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Holthus. I appreciate it. By the way, let's talk about the pronunciation of your name. Yes. You don't pronounce the T? Holthus. Holthus. Oh, it's like the Spanish thing. Holthus. Holthus. No, Holthus. Holthus. Okay, got it. Got it right here now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Judge. Thank you. Election Day. Very K.
We're good. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. We're back with uh, judicial candidate Nadia Kroll. The world is going through challenging times, and it's changing the way that we live and the way we do business. There will be hockey games and celebrations and fun times with friends and family. Kids will go back to school, and there will be graduations again. But in the meantime, we are trying to adapt to our new normal. Bernstein & Associates is still here doing what we've always done, and that's being present for our community. If you've been hurt, call me or go to our website. My team and I are here for you 24-7, and that will never change. Hi, welcome back. I'm back with uh, judicial candidate, Nadia Kral. And Nadia, you, you, oh, you grew up in Las Vegas, right? I have. Yes, I did grow up here. <laughs> She's laughing because I've known her family since she was uh, very little, very little girl. Um, but then you, um, you went to school at Boyd. Were you in the first class at Boyd? I was. Yeah, there was a class that started and then I was the first class to graduate in 2000. So I graduated 20 years ago. So what was, what's that like, you know, to be in the, the first class of, of, I mean, look, Boyd is such a prestigious law school now. When it started, a lot of people were skeptical whether it even would uh, get accredited and be, a, you know, a top-notch law school. And it became one. In fact, we have the number one write, writing program in the country. You know, at first I was a little scared about what was going to happen with the law school because if you graduate from a school that's not accredited, you're not able to take the bar exam in Nevada. But as soon as I met the dean, I knew that he would do whatever it took to get accreditation. And so I, I accepted and I never looked back. So it was a really fun and exciting time. And I'm just grateful that I had the opportunity to be part of that. Well, so how, how many, what was the first graduating class? How many student, law students did we have? There were five of us who graduated in 2000. There was about 75 who graduated in 2001. So it was a really tiny, tiny group of us who graduated a little bit earlier. Yeah. And now we're, we must be in the hundreds when we graduate now, right? Yes. We also were in elementary school. We weren't in the regular law school the way it is now. We were we went to school in elementary school, but it was fun because we really bonded with each other and everyone got to know each other and supported one another. So it was a time that it's good memories. Yeah. So uh, the other four uh, graduates, are they still practicing law in Nevada or have they moved on to other states? Two of them have passed away. Oh. And yeah, and then two are still practicing law. Well. Well, look, for the rest of your life, you're going to be in that first graduating class. You'll always, you'll always be known for that. Um, now you want to be known as a district court judge. Um, you've had, you know, really good career practicing uh, civil litigation for um, for a lot of years. You do what I do, do personal injury work. Yes. Uh, you do it well. Why, why, why become a judge? A lot of personal injury lawyers don't become judges. And I feel that having my own practice, I dealt with real people and, and real problems. How are you going to pay your mortgage or rent when it comes due? Where are you going to come up with the money if your car breaks down? I have been in with the community for all of these years, and I feel that I can bring that perspective, that compassion and empathy and hard work and determination to the bench. All right. So, um, so when you become a judge, I mean, and, and our, our last um, guest, uh, uh, Judge uh, Halthus, was a prosecutor. So uh, now uh, she handled, um, you know, criminal matters. She became a judge, and now she handles some civil matters and some criminal matters. Do you have a, a preference? My preference is civil because that is what I've done most of my career as, but I have done both civil and criminal in my almost 20 year career. I did an internship at the district attorney's office when I was in law school and I also have done criminal defense. And when I first got out of law school, I did civil defense. So I've been on both sides in both civil and criminal. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention about the law school is that I was actually the first student on the books to accept their acceptance. So I was the first student 
on the books and then I was one of the first five to graduate. So Frank Duran, he's one of the, he's, he's the Dean of Student Affairs. Yeah, he always says that uh, he has a special place in his heart for me because I was their first student. We have a lot of Boyd graduates that have gone on to become uh, judges and, and elected officials um, all over the state. It's, it's really, uh, in fact, if I, I guess if I took a poll now and you asked, you know, our judges, you know, what law school you came from, we probably have more from Boyd than from any other law school. Yeah, I agree. And it's a great law school because it, they really give back to the community and we're the only law school in the state. So it's very competitive to get in. And I know you have the immigration clinic. And they do a lot of pro bono work there as well, free legal work for members of the community. So it's a great law school. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned immigration. Um, you're you're a, a first generation American, correct? Your family were, came here as, as immigrants. Um, yes. Uh, you know, worked your way up. It, it's, um, you know, in that uh, Americana ladder. I mean, you're a success in, in having done that. Your parents were as well. Um, worked hard, you know. Um, when you when you look forward to becoming a judge, what do you what do you feel you have to do to transition from um, being an attorney to a judge? One of the great things about the experiences that I've had is that for four years I was a judge in small claims court, and that's a part time position. And there's no jury trials; it's all just the judge decides what's going to happen in the case and. Two thirds of those cases, people are unrepresented, which means they couldn't afford a lawyer. So I'm used to listening to both sides completely before making any decisions whatsoever. And that I think is one of the, the hardest things about becoming a judge. As a lawyer, it's easy. You can pick a side and you can just run with it. But as a judge, you have to put your own personal opinions to the side and listen to both sides and make sure that your mind's not made up when the parties walk into the courtroom. Look, I'm sure you've practiced in front of judges that have made you uh, less than happy. So when you're looking, going forward, there's got to be things you're saying to yourself, hey, I'm not going to be like this. I'm going to be like that. What is the like that? What is it, the things that you want to be known as? When I was in small claims court, one day, a lawyer came in who was a friend of mine. He was someone that I had studied with for the bar. So I knew him very, very well. And I had to rule against him. But that was something that takes courage as a judge to rule against your friends. And that's the kind of judge that I want to be like. When people ask me who's a judge I look up to and why, I say, you know what? All you want from a judge is someone who's going to be fair and who's going to say the reasons for their opinion. You may disagree, but as long as you understand where they're coming from and that you feel that they have listened to every argument you've made before coming to any conclusions, that's all you can ask for. And that's the type of judge that I would aspire to be like. Yeah, well, well said. Um, and I understand you uh, rock climb a little bit. I do. I love to rock climb. I, I love Las Vegas. There's a lot of rock climbing here. It's actually Red Rock is known for its rock climbing. It's world class. People come from all over the United States and different countries to climb here. Uh -huh. You don't get scared? I get scared of heights sometimes. Doesn't you know, look I do get scared sometimes, but the great thing about rock climbing is it forces you to confront your fears. And I think that transitions into life, that you're, you're in a situation when you're climbing, you're scared, you may not know how you're gonna get out of it, but you problem solve and you focus and you keep moving forward despite your fears. And that's the great thing about rock climbing. Yes, uh, I, I, I guess it works for some people. <laughs> that doesn't work for me at all. <laughs> but it, it's it's fun. You it takes you places you would never get to see otherwise. I wanted to ask you also about uh, how difficult it is a campaign in the current environment. Before before the COVID nineteen crisis, I was going to events and I was knocking on doors, which I loved. I didn't think I would like it so much, but 
when you knock on a stranger's door and then you leave feeling like you're a friend and not just telling them about you, but you listening to them. One of the areas that I went to a lot was Sun City, which is a retirement community. And people can live in a beautiful, fancy house, but that doesn't mean that they don't have their own problems. One of the things I realized is a lot of people are widowers and they're lonely. And a lot of times, especially seniors, I feel like they might feel discarded and no longer useful, but they still have a lot to offer. And just knocking on people's doors and talking to people one-on-one -on -one was such a, a great experience. I, I miss that with this, but I have been able to communicate with people via Zoom, which is great. And I've talked to a lot of people and they said they're actually able to talk to more people in Zoom because they don't have to drive places, so it's saving them time. So, and a lot of people are on social media, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, and you can really communicate with more people than you would if you're spending time just one-on-one -on -one with one person. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of criticism about the term uh, social distancing. People are saying, well, it's really a misnomer. It's more uh, physical distancing because yeah. for some people, there's a little bit more social, as you said, all the, the avenues to, to communicate, people are availing themselves of, of many of them. Um, and even our courts right now are using uh, technology. Um, and when you look at the technology that we're using and you look uh, toward the future, what, what do you see the, the future of our court system with, tech, with the technology? We have a minute left, sorry, but. <laughs> I actually see that this will help us bring technology more into the courtroom and allow people more access to justice than they would have had if they had to physically go down there, whether it's just resolving traffic tickets. Because if you get a traffic ticket, you might have to spend half a day at the courthouse because you can't just park right in the courthouse for security reasons. You have to park further away. You have to pay for parking. You have to walk there. You have to go through security. And perhaps with this new technology that everyone is using more frequently, we may be able to streamline those processes for people who don't have time or money to take half a day off of work to resolve a, a traffic ticket. That sounds like an excellent idea. <laughs> you get elected, you need to hammer that. <laughs> Thank you. Anytime we can avoid <laughs> driving downtown and having to wait hours at that and going through screening and security, blah, 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 it can make a lot of people's lives a lot easier. So thank you uh, so much, uh, Judicial Candidate, uh, District Court Candidate Nadia Kral. Um, there's a primary coming up. Uh, early voting is uh, right, right here, right at our doorstep. Mm -hmm. So you can mail in your ballots and uh, I'm sure uh, Nadia Kral will be <laughs> Happy to get your vote. Nadia. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for having me and everything you do for the community. Thank you. The world is going through challenging times, and it's changing the way that we live and the way we do business. There will be hockey games and fun times with friends and family again. In the meantime, we're here for you 24-7 doing what we've always done, and that will never change.